Good morning, church family. Good morning. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Let's move that just a little bit. Before we start class, let's have a quick prayer. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for all your many blessings. I ask that you calm my nerves, you open our ears and our hearts, and uh, you give me a message. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. As just a, a little small thing to start off, um, kind of a, a point of nerddom. For adoration and praise, that butterfly was the common buckeye, the wonderful butterfly you can find here in Georgia, and worship and giving, that was a cloudless sulfur, beautiful yellow butterfly. You know, in case you're interested. <laughs> um, so... The title for today's message is, When Leadership Isn't, and it's in italics, we'll get to that. I had been thinking a lot about what to speak on the second time, and this one uh, is connected, in a way, to the last time. And speaking of the last time, or here, or over there, I, maybe I didn't turn on. Ha-ha! <laughs> Thank you. Uh, last time here, I was here, perhaps this was the vibe. You know, polite smiles, but general confusion. I did say I've never been trained in homiletics. That's not me. Yet, here I am again, so I must have done something right. So today I do want to talk about something that's similar. Uh, it's not quite parallel to last time, like mentorship, but it's definitely connected. So instead of mentorship, I'd like to talk about leadership and the unwritten rule in leadership and the problem with the unwritten rule. When you think about leaders and leadership qualities, what do you think of? What comes to mind? I'm sure as soon as I said leader, a person popped into your brain. And if you're thinking about leadership qualities, what are you thinking about? Decisiveness, strength, action, perhaps uh, a few of these things on this list. You might naturally think of someone who gives out orders, someone who tells what others should be doing, because often that's what we default to for leadership. You might have a mental image of a person come to mind. So what happens if I put leadership on its head? What happens if I take these things and kind of wipe them away and say, no, there's actually one thing that's off of this list and is more important than all the rest? If I turn it upside down, perhaps our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ from Australia are now more comfortable. There's an unwritten rule for leadership. Unwritten. Something we inherently understand, but we don't pay heed to, and that's the problem. So before we talk about the problem, I'll give you four examples. One from governance, because if we're thinking about leadership, we're thinking about the government, who's leading our country. One from the church, actually two from the church. From the Bible again, and I'll give you a personal one. So... You may naturally question that order. It's just some rhetoric again. I need to lead with the pre buttle It's not even a rebuttal. It's a pre buttle Or maybe the exception that proves the rule. <clears throat> you see, the unwritten rule for leadership is in order to be an effective leader, you have to be able to stand back and let someone else lead. Identifying the person who would come after you when your time is done, mentoring them and then allowing them to lead. If you cannot do this humble task, then you will eventually lead, pun intended, to all sorts of negative consequences. Now, this first point, while we are talking about the government, is apolitical. I did say government, and I could find no better example case 
to show the exception that proves the rule. Imagine if there were old people. And I'm not trying to throw stones at anyone here today. Just imagine if there were old people who just wouldn't step out of the way for the next cohort of coming up leaders. How would new ideas come about? How would a change happen in the status quo? The same way of thinking would be reproduced time after time after time. Maybe that person would be uh, saying, only I can save you. Only I have the knowledge or skills. And this is pervasive. And it's not just at the top of the executive branch. It's with the legislative branch. It's with the judicial branch. You see, I teach history and science, so I know about butterflies and government. It's a great Venn diagram. They don't cross at all. Here's a lovely chart showing you the ages of our legislators in the Senate. The average age of these 100 members in the Senate is 64. The average age is retired. You have some of them pushing 90. It isn't much better in the House of Representatives either. The average there is slightly lower at 58. Here's a second chart. It's an interesting way of organizing data. And if you can see on the, well, for you, the left-hand side, it's the House of Representatives, and there's one little dot way at the bottom. This is uh, Representative Maxwell Frost, the youngest member of the House of Representatives from Florida, and he is 26 years old. He ran last year and ran at the absolute minimum of 25, because according to the Constitution, that's what you have to be to be a House of Representatives member, and won his election and then turned 26. Look, I don't know about his politics at all, and certainly do not mistake this as an endorsement. Remember, I said apolitical. This is the exception that proves the rule. During his election, during his campaign, what did his opponents try to use against him? His age, his youth. It was turned into a pejorative. I couldn't find any better example because he quite literally started at the minimum. People are not willing to pass the baton. In fact, it's become the exact opposite with our governmental leaders clawing and holding on to power, whether you be in the executive, legislative, or judicial branch. At its center, this is an issue of pride. And this brings us to our first of two verses for today. And this is Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. This is from the NIV. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above value others above yourselves. Do not look to your own interests, but to the interests of others. I don't know if maybe Congress is looking to the interests of others or to themselves. So we have our governmental example. What about the church? Does the Adventist church have the same problem? Yes and no. Let's go back to the start, to the foundation of the Adventist church. This summer was Teachers' Convention, and there was a wonderful, I guess you would say like a documentary, kind of, and I cannot figure out where it's at. But it talked about the history of Adventist education specifically. So you have people like G.H. Bell, Ellen White, James White, W.H. Ball. All of these people were relatively young in age when they stepped into leadership positions. Most notably about education. With W.H. Ball asking in the review in the 1850s if we need to provide our children education because the Lord is coming soon. And think about that question. There's a lot in there. Thankfully, he was answered rather firmly by Mr. White saying, of course, we need to provide education for our children. Children might have languished without a formal education. The Adventist church might have languished. So we started young-ish. But what about right now? 
do you know your Georgia Cumberland Conference leadership? It's Gary Rusted, a younger guy by the looks of things, and a quick search around the conference in the Southern Union, younger than most, to be honest. I'm always surprised when I meet him because he remembers my name, and I don't know why. Maybe it's the hair. So we've got one proof positive and one proof negative. We've got people who are maybe allowing the next generation to come into leadership positions and people who aren't. Let's go to the Bible for further examples. We can talk about three situations for leadership in the Bible. We'll take a look at Jesus, David, and Moses. So let's start with Jesus. We can find this story, in particular, at the tail end of Luke chapter 2. From the picture, photographic image from way back in the day, as you can see. You already know what this story is talking about. Jesus had been brought to the temple for the Passover festival. And as the story goes, he was left at the temple. Three days later, he was found among the teachers asking questions and discussing. Anything he answered brought amazement to those who heard it. Here, we might, you know, throw some stones again at the family for losing their child. Or naturally, we might throw some stones at some of the teachers. Perhaps they were Pharisees themselves. What is unwritten but had to have happened, was whomever was in charge needed to allow some space for Jesus to exist. To perhaps even be co-equal with these other teachers of the law. Think of that and what could have happened if some older, gruff gentleman had just booted young Jesus out of the temple because he was a child. What are you doing here? Where are your parents? Go home. Later on in life, we see a second example with Jesus on the other side, speaking to Peter. Whole sermons could be spoken about Jesus and his disciples. And even with just the verse, and on this rock I shall build my church. We don't have time to get in that, and I feel particularly poorly equipped there. However, what I want you to take from this is Jesus is preparing those to lead after him. After he is gone, a great example of leadership. How about David? This wet behind the year, ears youth as he challenged Goliath to a fight in 1 Samuel. Saul even attempted to stand in his way, discouraging him, saying, you're only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. A failing of leadership, perhaps? Maybe. After all, who could imagine a young shepherd boy would defeat the Philistines' greatest warrior? All is good in chapter 17 of 1 Samuel until chapter 18, when Saul hears the people singing and chanting, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And now we have a great example of negative leadership. Saul began to fear David, Instead of looking at himself and his own failings, he grew envious. He even tried to kill David. There is the real failing of leadership. Not expecting who's coming after you. Our last part from the Bible, we'll go with Moses and Joshua. Again, we've had proof positives and proof negatives, good examples and bad examples. However, with Moses and Joshua, it's kind of a mystery. We know that Moses led the Israelites for 40 years. We know that it was God's appointment. We also know that God chose Joshua to be next in command. We don't really know that relationship between Moses and Joshua. Did he spend those 40 years training Joshua along with leading? I cannot say. It's a question for later on. What I can say is simply that baton was passed from Moses to the next generation. And so now we're to our last example, a more personal one. <clears throat> Oop, sorry, too quick. This is Miss LaRock. 
Don't look too hard at that yearbook picture, perhaps in the center of the yearbook. That's a version of myself I haven't seen since freshman year and a bull haircut. This is 2001, my freshman yearbook. You see, this was also Miss Larocque's first year as well. I know it may be tiny, but underlined is saying the department gained a new science teacher. She was just hired by the school. This was her first year. This was my freshman year, and I had her as my teacher. I love science, so I was super interested. However, I was slightly bored in the class. It's not because she wasn't a good teacher, because maybe the other students weren't as advanced. So she was doing the right thing, taking the time to make sure everyone was kind of moving along. And I was already ahead. So what happens when a student's bored in class? Get in trouble? Disrespectful, I heard someone say. <gasps> Not I. <laughs> I spent more time talking in class with my friends than I spent listening to Miss LaRock. One year near the, uh, sorry, one day near the end of the year, the second nine weeks exam, you know, first nine weeks, second nine weeks, so we're getting towards December. We're doing our exam review, and I was not paying attention at all. I was talking with my friends in class. I was goofing off. And like any good teacher, she called me out. She asked me a question. I don't remember what it was, but I got it right. So she went back to teaching, and I went back to talking. I should have taken that as a, a hint of, hey, you're probably being a little disruptive in class. She called on me again, and I got the second question correct. Again, I, honestly, I don't remember what she asked me. I remember we were studying about the earth, so it may have something to do with the layers, right, the crust, the mantle, the core. The third time, I guess I hadn't learned humiliation yet, she called on me and simply asked, do you want to teach the class? with a hint of frustration in her voice. And of course, me, smart-mouthed, snot-nosed kid, said, yeah, I want to teach the class. I'm glad I've grown. I'm glad I've grown. What, what do you do in that situation as a teacher? Well, call the bluff. Call the bluff. She said, fine, you're doing the test review tomorrow because we reviewed for two days before the, the nine weeks exam. Okay, let's, let's see what we're gonna do. I did, in fact, do the review. I walked into class, and she made me stand up in front of the class, much like I am here, in front of the chalkboard, and she made me try to help the class review for the material. And she wouldn't let me sit down, if I didn't know what was going on next, or if I didn't know the material, she would kind of support it, but she made me stand there for the entire 50 minutes. Ms. LaRock saw something in me, because after that day, she asked if I wanted to do the exam review again, and if I wanted to also do the test reviews. So not only the nine weeks exam, but the individual smaller tests. I spent the rest of the year doing one of the two days for the exam review and uh, a shorter test review for half the class and becoming a peer tutor. This is my first introduction to teaching. However, the next year, this is my yearbook from 2002, when I came back to school, she had left. She was only there one year, 2001 to 2002. I didn't even get a chance to say thank you or goodbye. Perhaps she was asked to leave because it was found out that a student was doing work teaching and doing review for the class. I don't know. I often wonder if she's still teaching 24 years later. For her, 2001 might not have just been another year, but for me, it was a huge deal. So now this is how I operate. I look at my own students for future leaders and then do what I can to ensure they have the opportunity to lead, to actually lead, whether that be in the clubs and classes that I sponsor or encouraging them to run for student association or campus ministries. I give the students a real chance at leading, 
Instead of me organizing the meeting, dealing with the agenda, trying to do fundraising, and I do, but also I give it to them and say, hey, what are you going to make of this? And AAA has had some amazing student leaders in the past. We've had people start clubs out of their own desire at AAA, like a black student union or an art club. People are taking to leadership. If I would conduct everything, it'd be easier for the student, probably be easier for me, we might even be more effective, but they would never learn. A word for the young and a slight edit for us older people here, our second verse for today, again from Paul, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. Set an example for believers in speech, in conduct, in love, and in purity. And if I can just make that one little edit, instead of saying, don't let anyone look down on you, maybe for us who are a little more seasoned, maybe don't look down on anyone because they are young. How many other Davids have been put aside because they were too young? How many other real, true leaders have been passed up because the first time they opened their mouth, they were told, uh, it's not your thing, sit down, we got it. How many church leaders, choir directors, Sabbath school teachers, pastors? Imagine if those situations, someone said, no, I'm going to stay in power. You stay in your place, stay in your lane, I'm going to stay in power because I know what I'm doing and you don't. You're too young, you don't have the experience. If that same situation were to play out, Jesus might not have been able to speak at the synagogue. And I know some people were shown the truth that day. I know it. It doesn't record it in the Bible, but we can infer from their amazement, truth was shown. The 12 apostles might have had even more rancor and infighting and separation after Jesus left to prepare a house for us all. The Adventist church might have gotten started without education or without education at all. Me, I might not have become a teacher. An impressionable ninth grader might have taken a different path. You see, I see God's hand in all of these situations. And instead of putting a giant hand, I figured this fits better. Proverbs 19.21. Yet it still requires, even if God's hand is in all of these situations, it still requires the people in power at the time willing to sit back and let someone else lead. Willing to observe and say, you know what? This person's got something. Let someone take over, even just a part, even for just a bit. Because look, we can't continually tell our congregation and our schools, you guys are the future, and then give them no place to fit in that future. Give them no voice for that future. Give them no position to change their own future. When you find someone who is capable, when you find someone who's able, when you find someone who fits 1 Timothy, I want to encourage you to mentor them, to train them, to inspire them, to empower them, and then, at the very end, allow them to lead. Because sometimes leadership isn't leading. Thank you.